I love studying God's Word. It's true. It's impactful. It speaks to me every time I read it. It says something different. I've been reading it all my life and just love to see what the different authors have written, spoken through the Holy Spirit. So I have the opportunity to, to study the Bible on the way to work. I have about a 15-minute commute. I love just pulling up the Bible Gateway app, listening to Max McLean read scripture. I usually get a chapter or two on my way to work. It really is different hearing it as opposed to reading it. And I'm also putting in my head on the way to work, not just all these things that I have to do that day, but putting in God's Word and just a real enjoyable and love to do it. I think hearing the Word is very different for people than reading the Word. I think it speaks to you differently. Uh, the benefit of it is obviously it's convenient, it's easy, you can do it while you're in the car. All of us are pressed for time and gives me a chance to do two things. I'm commuting to work and also listening to the Bible at the same time. I also find myself then when I do read it, uh, looking back at things I've heard in the different chapters and I'm able to really get a little different flavor, a little different reflection on it. It doesn't take away my study time, but it really is enjoyable to hear the word. So when I became a Christian at 15, almost 16 years old, a guy named Doug kindly bought me a new Bible, a study Bible. He got me a cool brown cover with a cross on it, and he said, this is God's word, you're supposed to read it. That was my training, and so I did. I had no idea, I had no idea what happened when a person filled with the Spirit of God, because when you become a Christian, when you confess your sins and come to the cross and receive Jesus, when you become a Christian, the Spirit of the living God spiritually moves into you, never leaves. I had no idea what would happen when you would take a person filled with the Spirit and then take the book inspired by the Spirit and put those together. But here's what happened to me. Here's what happened. <laughs> I mean, everything changed. I started reading this book every day and, and, and something would happen every day. And even the times that something wasn't happening that I could notice, I knew there was something going on. God was getting me ready for something. And so when a person filled with the Spirit reads the book inspired by the Spirit and those things come together, something happens. I had no idea that, that this book would be the book that in my times of deepest pain and deepest sorrow and deepest struggle would comfort me. That the Spirit of God would use the words of God to comfort a child of God. But man, I've experienced that over and over through the years. And if you're a Christian who reads the Bible, so have you. I also had no idea that I could open this book and begin to read it and, and it would reveal the depth of my sin and the depth of my brokenness and the depth of my rebellion. Man, as a teenager, as, as a young adult, I knew I was going to be a pastor. That's what I was training for. But man, there were times where I, I would think things that I wouldn't want to think and I'd say things I wouldn't want to say and I'd do things I wouldn't want to do. And, I, and, and it wasn't just then. It's still today. There's times where... where where I, said this, I want to say like the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 7, the things I hate to do... I find myself doing, and the things I want to do, I have a hard time doing. And then Paul says, wretched man that I am. He's like, man, what's going on with me? And, I, and I, I've felt that through the years, but when I read this book, it reminds me who I am. It brings me back to the truth. It convicts me of sin. It comforts me in times of need. Every time I read this book, God does something. And that will be true for you, or it is true for you. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you come to the cross and receive Jesus Christ and confess your sins, and the Spirit moves in, every time you, a Spirit-filled person, encounters the Spirit-given Word of God, God will do something. Sometimes it's kind of like eating a meal where you don't eat a meal and go, I feel, it's not like Popeye, you know, I feel stronger, ooh, I'm strong because I ate spinach right now, right? I mean, there's times you eat a meal, you don't notice what it's doing, but after a series of good meals, it strengthens your body. God's doing something through his word every time we open it. And so for the next 30 days, we're going to be talking about the word of God and what, and what we learn about God's word. And I'm going to give you a challenge for the next 30 days. Every person in the worship center, family worship venue, and online. I want to give you, you can choose one of these two challenges. 
Or option three is you can do none of them, but I, I want to invite you to consider these two challenges. Here's number one. Make a commitment for the next 30 days, every day, to read the Bible for at least five minutes. You can read a lot more than that if you want to, but say at least five minutes. And then as you read it, you say, Spirit of God, you live in me, you inspired this book, speak to my heart. And look for one thing that God could kind of challenge you in or comfort you in or do, do something in you, one way that God works. So try that for 30 days and see what God does. If you don't know where to read or where to start, use the, the guide that we have in our bulletin every week and on the, the church website. You can use that as your listening or your reading guide. You either read or listen to the Bible every day for 30 days. That's challenge number one. Here's challenge number two. If you've never tried something like this or if you have, I want to challenge you to consider studying the Bible for 30 days. Do an in-depth study of the book of James. The book of James really is practical, hits real life issues. And the challenge would be to read a chapter a day and as you do, use some great resources to help you keep growing around that and take you deeper into the history, the background, how to apply these things. And so we've gotten you, we went out and looked for what we thought were the best resources. Uh, we've got a, a what I would call this a devotional commentary. We have these back in our bookstore. We're doing them, we're selling, selling them for what we got them for plus shipping and all that. So it's, we're trying to get the best price for you. So a devotional commentary, the NIVAC New International Version Application Commentary Series. I think it's the best commentary series out there. This is the commentary on James. This would be more uh, what a pastor would use when they're studying to preach, but there's lots of great history and background here. And you can use your computer or your phone to take notes, or we have just good old-fashioned notepads, okay? And, then, and you can take one of these to keep your notes in James. And this is a visual theology guide to the Bible. This is kind of a, a, a visual walk through the entire, entire Bible, how it came together, how it was put together. So this would be valuable as well. Some of you say, man, I want to go deeper. I want to jump in at that level. For 30 days to be in one book of the Bible, James and one chapter a day, and then take some other resources and really study. I want to challenge you to pick one of those two. And for the next 30 days, be in God's word and see what he does and see how he works. I think you will be amazed. I think you will be inspired. Now, every time we read the Bible, something happens. And one of the things that happens when we read the Bible is there's this, there's this sweetness, there's this joy, there's this, there's this goodness that comes to us. Reading the Bible can inspire us, uplift us, and fill our soul with joy and our life with power. Sometimes when we read the Bible, it just, it just fills us. It just blesses us. It just strengthens us. It's not like there's a call to do some new thing. You just go, oh, this is so good. It's exactly what my soul needed. There's those moments. I did a quick uh, bit of math and figured out I've been reading the Bible on a daily basis for about 15,000 days since I became a Christian. 15,000 days. Yes, he's that old. Uh, 15,000 days. And somebody, some of you are going backwards and doing, doing the math. It's just a little over 40 years, all right? Um, and so 365 times, you know, 40 and then some. And so, you know, as, as I read the Bible, I can tell you even right now, every time I read this book, God shows me something fresh and something new. Even though I've been reading it daily for that long. Because the Spirit of God has new things to say to this child of God. And the word of God becomes the way that God communicates to me. It's powerful. It's life-changing. Now, here's a question. When I was 15, 16, 17, were there some things I read in the Bible that I didn't understand? Here's the answer. Yes. It's a, it, I, was, I grew up in a non-Christian home. I'd never even read any of the Bible stories. I mean, I, I had no framework. But I was given a Bible and told it was the word of God, so I started reading. There were, there were a lot of things I didn't understand. And remember that the new parts of this book, the new parts were written 2,000 years ago in another part of the world, right? So there's history, there's context, there's background. Now I've been a pastor for over, you know, I've been a pastor for over half of my life. And you say, well, are there parts of the Bible you still don't understand? The answer is yes. There's still parts I don't fully understand, but here's the beauty of it. The stuff I do understand will keep me learning to grow and follow Jesus for a lifetime anyways. So I may not get everything all the time, but the parts I do get, God uses to transform and speak, and I believe he wants to do the same to you. He wants to move in your life and work in your life. I want to invite you to listen to God's word. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Psalm 119. If you want to memorize a chapter of the Bible, don't make it Psalm 119. <laughs> or maybe you should. Maybe you should, but it's the longest chapter in the Bible. I'm going to start reading at verse 97 to give you a perspective. If you go back two Psalms, to Psalm seven, uh, uh, 117, it's only two verses long. So if you want to memorize a whole book, start there and then jump to Psalm 119. But let me start in verse 97 and just listen to the heart of the psalmist. 
Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. And listen to, listen to verse 103. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. The psalmist says, there's times I read your word, your book, God, and I just, I just, in my mind, it's like that scene in What About Bob? Where, where Bob Wiley is sitting at the table, Dr. Leo Marvin's at the end, and the two kids are there, and then the mom's there, and he's eating corn. If you've never seen it, it's an amazing scene. Just, just do a YouTube on What About Bob dinner scene. And, 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 and this guy, Bob, is just, he's eating this corn, he's going, mm, 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 that's, oh, oh, this is just, oh, and he's, he's just loving the corn, and everybody around the table, well, the kids and the wife are kind of delighting and happy, and then Leo Marvin is really angry, that, but it's, it's part of the story, but, but he, he just sits there, and finally he says, oh, is this hand shucked? I don't know if there's a way to shuck, any other way to shuck corn, but um, anyways, it's just this beautiful scene. And I think that, that, that the psalmist is saying, your word is so sweet when I, when I eat it. It's sweet to my taste. It's just like, it just makes me go, oh, this is so good. So some of you, when you read that psalm, you think, what, what is it that makes you go, that's so delicious, that's so good. So maybe, maybe for you, it's honey. Maybe that picture works for you. But maybe that, maybe that doesn't work for you. And that doesn't make you go, mmm. So let's try something for you. Let's see if this gets you going. Okay, how about candy? How about really good, well-made, delicious? And maybe that makes you go, you take a bite and you just go, mmm, this is so good. Not working for you? Now, those aren't working for my wife. But this is where my wife can connect. Fresh fruit. For Sherry, she, you know, when she eats fruit, she, she, just, she just, oh, she savors it. She grew up on fruit. I'm still not there yet. <laughs> so for me, we got to go to tile number four here. A really good chunky salsa, fresh chips, given as a gift from the hand of God Almighty. Um, you know, for me, eating a great salsa is just like, oh, it's so good. And the point is that reading God's word, there's moments, there's times where opening the word of God and reading it, you just go, God, this is so good. So yeah, sometimes it convicts, but there's times where just, God, this is so good. Sometimes it challenges, but this is just, there's moments, just God, it's your comfort, it's your grace, it's your goodness, it's your sweetness. And I want to talk about that today. Those moments in our life where by picking up the word of God, we, we find what we need to satisfy our souls. We're invited to taste and see that God's word is so good. And here's the first situation I want to talk about. In times of struggle, loss, and pain, let God's word speak. There's times of struggle and loss and pain where we just need the word of God to speak to our souls. Before I became the pastor at Shoreline, I was a, church in West Mich I was a pastor of a church in West Michigan. It's the first church I was a lead pastor at. And I was there for 14 years. And there was a woman named Lois Van Heitzma. Everyone called her Grandma Lois. And Grandma Lois was a prayer warrior. She welcomed and greeted people who came to visit the church. She had a beautiful heart. And her and her husband, Peter, were kind of a team. She was the warm, friendly greeter who would come in just and give you a hug and welcome you and say, we're glad you're here. And Pete would sit off to the side, but after Grandma Lois met someone, she'd go back to Pete and she'd say, okay, now his name is this and her name is this and their kid's name is this. And Pete would just lock it all away. That was his part. He was the memory bank for the couple. Then she'd go the next week, she'd see him, she'd go to Peter and she'd say, Peter, we met them last week, right? Yes. Who are they? And he'd go, do, 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 give her all the names. Then she'd go over and come get them, right? And, um, and Grandma Lois and Peter were this beautiful couple, loved Jesus, an important part of the church. Well, Turn the clock ahead a number of years, and uh, Peter's getting near the end. He's at home. Grandma Lois is caring for him, and she calls the church and says, uh, I think Peter's going to go to be with Jesus soon. Can Pastor Kevin come over? So I went over and sat at Peter's bedside in their, in their living room. It was a kind of a hospital bed in the living room there. 
And uh, we visited and prayed and read some scripture. And then Grandma Lois went and did a few things in the kitchen. And I was kind of watching Peter. And as a pastor, you, you walk through enough journeys with people that are near the end of life that you can kind of tell. And I said, Grandma Lois, you'll probably want to come back in here now. And she came and she stood right at the head of the bed next to Peter and took his, took his hand and um, she just loved him so much. And he, he, knew, he knew what was going on. He didn't look afraid. He just knew it was near the end. And so I, I said, let me just read God's word. And I read, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And as I read, Peter's breathing just became slower and, and, and lighter. And I just continued to read, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. I remember Peter took kind of a big breath. One more breath. And I wrote, surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And Peter breathed his last breath with Grandma Lois next to him, and he went to be with Jesus. There's moments where nothing's as sweet and nothing's as beautiful and nothing's as good and as helpful and as appropriate than the Word of God. In those moments, man, have it tucked in your heart. Have it locked in your mind. Have it part of your life. You're going to need those, you're going to need God's word in those moments. And, and, and if you hit one of those moments and, and you just say, boy, I, I need some scriptures for the comfort of God, literally all you have to do is take your phone or take, take, a, take a, a tablet and just type, type, go open up Google and say, Bible passages that comfort us in times of pain, and it'll give you lists of passages. And open God's word and read it or listen to it. Let it fill your heart and let it fill your mind. Taste and see God's word is so good. That's the invitation. And his word is good in times of deep awareness of our sin and our brokenness. In those moments, we need to let the word of God speak to us. When we're struggling, when we're, when we're, when we're looking at our life and saying, I'm, I'm not living the way I know I should. I made, I made that choice again to do that thing when I committed I wouldn't. When we feel like the Apostle Paul in Romans 7, where he says, I don't understand what I do. In those moments where we realize that again, we've entered in that place where our attitudes, our words, our actions, our thoughts don't honor Jesus. And that's when the enemy of your soul comes in and loves to lie to you. God doesn't love you. You're worthless. You're terrible. John chapter 10 tells us that, 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 that Satan, our enemy, is a liar and the father of the lies. And when he speaks, he lies because that's his native language. And in those moments, the enemy whispers in your ear or whispers into your heart, you're terrible, you're the worst. And we often believe it. And in those moments, go to God's word or have God's word in you so you know the truth. You have to battle the lies with the truth, the ultimate truth that comes from God's word. In those moments for me, one of the places I love to turn is to Romans chapter 8. If you want to remember who you are in this battle with sin, and, and even though when you come to the cross and you receive Jesus, your sin's washed away, we still stumble into sin at times. And in those moments, we have to remember who we are. So Romans 8, 1 says this, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Remember that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. Jesus paid the price. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, not by what, because of what we did, but because of what Jesus did. May be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And I'm just reminded, I'm not condemned, but also I don't live according to the flesh. I live according to the spirit. I'm gonna seek to live differently in the power of the spirit. 
God's word battles the lies of the enemy. And too often we hear those lies. We hear them quietly in our mind or our heart. We hear them through culture. We hear them through people who put us down. And we just say, God, speak your truth to me. And you want to know the truth of God? You want to be reminded of who you are and how your sins are cleansed? This book is the story that tells us how that all works and how it happened. In those moments when, when you're hearing the lies, and then you, you take God's word, and you put it in your mind and your heart, and you know the truth, you just go, oh, this is so good. This is so sweet. This is exactly what I needed. We miss that if we don't open the book. We miss that if we're not learning and growing in God's word. We are invited to taste and see that God's word is so good. In times we wonder who we are and what we are worth, let God's word speak. In those moments where you start going, I'm just, who am I? What does my life matter? Nobody, nobody seems to care about me. I don't seem to contribute a whole lot. When we start, by again, the lies of the enemy about ourselves, who we are. Man, you, you open this book, and this book speaks to you, man. When, when your company's downsizing, you lose a job, and you feel like, oh, what's my identity? Go to this book. When, when, when you're part of a group of friends, and all of a sudden you're not part of that group of friends, and you feel completely left out, go to this book and say, who am I? When the person who said, I love you, I'll always be here for you, says, I don't love you anymore, and I'm going away, go to this book, because the enemy wants to tell us, hey, you're not worth much, and God says, let me tell you who you are. Now get this book in your heart and your mind and you will know your identity. So 1 Peter chapter 2, one of my favorite passages. The first big chunk of the Bible I memorized was 1 Peter. I, I memorized the whole book when I was, at, when I was in college. And, um, and, and so this, was, this has been part of my heart and my mind for, since I was a, you know, a teenager, uh, 19, 20 years old. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's who you are. Royal priesthood, holy nation, special possession, the declarers of God's truth redeemed, loved, forgiven. If you've come to the cross and received Jesus Christ, that's who you are. How are you going to be reminded of that? From the world? No. From ourselves? Unfortunately, a lot of the time, not. We believe the lies. We open this book and let the Spirit of God, this God-breathed truth, just, just drive into our hearts so we can hold to who we are and know who we are. Taste and see. God's word is so good. In times we feel spiritually discouraged, we let God's word speak. There's, there's times where we just feel kind of numb spiritually. We just kind of feel distant from Jesus. Some of you may be there, yes, I'm in church, but man, I just sing the songs, but I don't feel a connection with Jesus, and, and I'm not sure what's going on there, but I just, I just, I just don't feel kind of discouraged spiritually, and I'm not being, feeling propelled along in my faith. Man, in those times, you need the book. You need God's word. And you need to have it in your mind and in your heart and part of your life. When you feel far from God, I would challenge you to go to Romans chapter 8. This passage, Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 31, and just, just let the words of Scripture wash over you and speak the truth to you. Listen to what God inspires by the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. Verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? The answer is nobody. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? You know what he's saying? If God the Father would give his own son for us, what wouldn't he give to us? Verse 33. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble 
or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. You know, Paul says, man, there's going to be hard times. It's difficult. Christians were being persecuted back then. But he's saying, but, but will, will these things separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus? And then in verse 37, he answers his own question. No, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, neither death nor life, Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Somebody shout amen. amen. And Paul says, I'm, I'm certain of this. Man, we need to know the book. We need to let the Spirit of God the, the, the spirit who's inspired and breathed the word of God speak to our hearts and transform our lives. That, that's so desperately needed for every single one of us. And when we do, we're gonna just, just say, oh God, your word is so sweet. Your word is so delicious. I, I long for it. You know, I, I probably have chips and salsa two or three days a week. I open, th I open this book every day, right? Because this gives me life. This gives me truth in a world filled with deception. This word speaks to my heart. In times, there's times we need to taste and see when God's word is good. In times when we feel threatened and fearful, we let God's word speak. There's moments where, where fear just sort of kind of comes knocking on our back door and descending on our life. We had a chance to pray together as a congregation last week when the Stroud family found out that, uh, that Jake, um, their son, had gone for a hike, was lost in the wilderness. And, uh, and by God's grace, he was not only found, but he was sitting in the second row over here at, at the service, uh, second service, uh, first service this morning. But when, when Sean, one of our pastors, called me, here's a dad who says, my son's somewhere out in the wilderness. He ended up on a, he thought he was doing a five-mile trail, ended up on a 20-mile trail, ended up getting off the trail and lost, and finally a, a team found him. But, but here dad is, and his son, it's, it's, it's dark now, and his son's out there in the wilderness. And so Sean went with some people, and they, he said, I gotta go, we got to go find my son. I said, absolutely. But, but one of the things Sean told our staff on Monday morning is he said, boy, there's some things I learned, and one of the things I learned is the place of God's word in those moments where fear comes in. And so I thought instead of me trying to share his story, I'd ask him to. So if you just watch the screen. Well, you know, this past weekend uh, was probably one of the most difficult experiences that uh, my wife and I have ever been through as, as both parents and as um, family. Uh, when our son Jake, he was actually lost for a period of over 24 hours in the Ventana Wilderness, which is down south on uh, Big Sur, and it's probably one of the most difficult and rugged uh, areas in all of California to hike. And first and foremost, I, I'm just so thankful that once we determined, found that he was not coming back home on Saturday night, that I was able to call Pastor Kevin and Pastor Kevin was immediately able to alert the, the family of Shoreline uh, to begin to pray. And so I just was, I'm so thankful, my wife and I, our entire family, uh, Jake and his family are so thankful for all of the prayers and for all the support that the Shoreline family and so many others around the world extended uh, over that period where Jake was missing. And so we took off down south and we were headed down there with a group of five of us and as we got to the place where uh, we found Jake's car, uh, we made the determination that myself and my son were gonna go in and hike the trail where he would have hiked. And as we were getting ready to go up on that hike, uh, even though it was nighttime and even though it was dark, I just found great confidence in knowing that uh, we were bolstered by prayer from so many, but also I knew that, that I had God's word to be able to turn to during that time when, when fear, of course, was, was naturally surrounding me. And then I kind of reflected as I was down there getting ready to go out that, you know, I was scheduled to preach a sermon on Sunday morning that was called Confidently Living in Fear-Filled Times. And what I didn't realize is that 
that I wouldn't get the opportunity to preach that sermon, but I'd prepared, but I actually was gonna live that sermon out over the next 24 hours. And one of the things that really helped uh, carry me through and probably one of the biggest lessons I learned from that experience uh, of, of actually going out and searching for my son was the power of God's word and the truth and the strength and the encouragement and the comfort and the confidence and the protection that it brought uh, for me and for my family as we were looking for our son. I didn't have my Bible app and I didn't have my Bible with me, but I was able to really reflect on the scriptures that I buried in my heart. You know, things like Isaiah 40, 31, you know, the Lord gives strength to the weary. So Lord, give me strength, give my son strength. I was able to pray that. And then as we got to the top and, and we, we actually began to experience the, the fact that, that Jake wasn't found yet and we are just hitting the 24 hour mark, I just reflected on the words that Jesus shared with his disciples in John 16, 33. And Jesus said, you know, I've told you these things so that in me, you will have peace. And Jesus reminded him, he said that in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And it was at that time when I just pretty much said, okay, Jesus, he's with you either way. And I trust in you. And it was about an hour later when we got the call. We got the call from the deputy sheriff and he said, we found Jake and we're bringing him to safety. And Jesus, I'm just so thankful for your word and so thankful for your mercy and your safety and salvation for my son, Jake. Yeah, amen. As a church, thank you for your prayers at that time, and also I think over 200 people were ready to go from shoreline if needed, and the, you know, he was found at the end of the third service, and we were in waiting mode, but thank you for your part in that. But what, what do you do when you're going through those kind of times in life if you don't have God with you, if you don't know the truth of his word, and God's word strengthens us. I love Isaiah 43, one through three, and this was in my sermon, uh, uh, this was in my sermon, this sermon I wrote, although I thought last night of calling Sean and saying, hey, why don't you preach tomorrow? But I decided not to. Um, but uh, but, but I, I, this sermon was finished probably two or three weeks before this happened with Jake. But it, the pastor says this, but now this is what the Lord says, he who created you, Jacob. So it's interesting, Jacob is a name for Israel. He who formed you, Israel, this, he means God's people. Listen to what it says. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine, God says. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. You are invited to taste the sweet word of the living God. You're invited every day to taste and see what God has for you. And some days it might be a challenge, and some days it might be a conviction, but a lot of times it's just going to be the sweetness and the goodness of God. Um, I'm going to take my little throat lodger out of there because I've got a bowl of chips here <laughs> and some salsa, and I want you to know that God's word is better to me than this, but this is really good. If I'm looking for good green sauce, I go to Jose's. I'll give you a little tour of the Mexican restaurants. A little green sauce, I go to Jose's. If I want the best chili verde, most tender in town, I go to La Tortuga. But if I want great habanero, habanero hot sauce, I go to Turtle Bay. And this is, uh, they, they, have this, they have this chunky salsa with jicama in it. So it's real crunchy. And then this habanero sauce next to it. And then you just add as much habanero as you, as you want to your chunky salsa, which is what I've done, which is a lot of habanero. And then you dig in. I can't eat another one right now, but I want to. Oh. Mm, 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 mm. And this, this is way better. Every day, every day, every day. Oh Lord, we pray that we will leave here today inspired to know your word more, to love your word more. 
Lord, in those moments when we need comfort and care and we're discouraged and we just like, like, a, like a dry desert ground needs water to rain on it, you want to just fill us with the, the water of your word, the, the sweetness of honey, the, the delight of fresh fruit, the exquisite taste of a great salsa, whatever it is, Lord. Let us, let us taste and experience the goodness of your word in a way beyond what we ever had before. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Before you stand up, before I send you out of here with a word of blessing, I want to give you an invitation. If, if, there's a, if you're going to be leaving Monterey, leaving Shoreline Church in the next three or four months, we don't want you just to kind of disappear. We want to give you a little gift and pray for you and bless you before you leave. And so if you know you're leaving the next three or four months after the service, after I give you a blessing, when I dismiss you, just go right down the hallway to, to the Peninsula Room. And we want to meet you. We want to give you a sending coin. And uh, it's got Acts 1.8. You'll become my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. And we want to give you a book to take with you. And we want to pray over you. So come and join us. Um, if, you, if you want to know more about Bible studies at Shoreline or learning experiences, go to the Connection Center. And if you want to jump into the study in the book of James, all the resources are in the Connection Center. First service people were kind of greedy and took a lot of them, but we still have some of each of these left, and so if we need more, we'll order more. So go by there and talk with them. If you need prayer for anything, come forward for prayer, and if you're dealing with just a tough challenge under the cross here, we have a team ready to lay on hands, if, lay hands of your request to anoint you with oil to pray for whatever you need. And if you want to know more about Shoreline, there's a team in the Connection Center that just makes them so happy to tell you about what's going on here, so go talk to them, and if you're brand new, go by there. They want to give you a gift and answer your questions. If you're able to stand, will you stand with me to receive a word of blessing? You go from here into a world that often says there is no truth or truth is yours to make up. But you have the ultimate truth of God's word. Feed on it. Partake of it. Delight in it every single day. And be amazed at what God does in you and through you for the glory of Jesus. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.